welcome to Europe Debates. Uh, I'm Richard Milson, the Director of the European Conservative and Reformist Party in Brussels, and thank you for joining me for our weekly and popular series of webinars. Today's debate addresses the question of the European elections one year on. It's been a year since the European elections in 2019, and the new European Commission has had a rocky start. From the stalled appointment of the Commission President, to delays in producing a budget, and now the Union's weak response to the coronavirus pandemic. The political fabric of Europe has also changed, with voters uh, now turning further away from mainstream parties to support new alternatives. Conservative parties across Europe are also seeing a surge in support from Sweden to Italy, Spain, Netherlands and Poland. Today we will discuss what has changed since the European elections and what we expect to see in the years to come. Now this webinar is live streamed across multiple platforms including YouTube, Facebook and Twitter uh, and our website. And we're very grateful to the many people that will be following the debate online. And please uh, do use the comment section so that you can ask questions, which I will relay to the panel. So without further ado, do, let's get it started. And I would like to invite our panel to each give a five minute introductory remark, starting with our first panelist, Charlie Wiemers. Now, Charlie is a Swedish member of the European Parliament since 2019 and for the Sweden Democrats Party. Previously, he was chairman of the Young Swedish Democrats and elected to the Hamro Municipal Council. In Brussels, he sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, and we're delighted to have you with us here today. So, Charlie, perhaps uh, you could kick us off with uh, how much, uh, you know, have we seen much progress being made since the European elections last year? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Richard. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, the ECR party for having me. Um, I want to start with um, the process that led to the election of the commission and its president, because that was a very important institutional battle. Um, and we need to remind ourselves what happened, and we need to remind the Federalists about what happened. So, me personally, I voted against Ursula von der Leyen as commission president. I voted against the commission. Uh, I was in the minority, uh, that's a grim reality, but uh, I'm the kind of guy who uh, always look on the bright side of life. Uh, and to see the member states ride roughshod over the Spitzenkandidat process was a source of immense satisfaction, um, as the process lacked legal and democratic legitimacy. Here we have the EP and the Christians Dem Christian Democrats along with their socialist and liberal buddies. Um, trying to revive the old federalist dream of a directly elected EU president. They tried to, uh, through Michel Barnier, uh, get it into uh, the EU constitution 20 years ago, but uh, they failed. Now they tried again and they failed once again, and I hope that they will learn something from the fact that Swedes, Spaniards, Italians, or the Dutch didn't give a rip about any Spitzenkandidat. So during this process, um, I, I, um, I noted that uh, the Swedish government uh, decided to nominate uh, Ulva Johansson as, uh, as commissioner. And uh, um, her portfolio is one of the most important in, um, in the European Union. Uh, so, so after having taken out Timmermans, uh, the v Visegrad 4, who's normally very uh, strong on these issues, decided to greenlight a former card-carrying communist and a minister in a government that implemented Via Schaffendas on steroids, Ulva Johansson. She has, um, she has uh, declared that overseas migrant reception centers are unrealistic and that uh, they have legal and practical question marks. She has chastised Greece for defending their borders when Turkey weaponized illegal migrants. Um, she's pushing a Swedish agenda and her much anticipated migration package will fail unless the commission bribes the East and that will cost a lot. She is not willing to do the rational thing and cut immigration. And I think that we will be uh, one of the most blatant failures of the commission in this uh, mandate.
Well, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. It's interesting that you mentioned the Spitzen candidate campaign, because, of course, here at the ECR party, uh, you know, it is the European political parties that are supposed to run these campaigns. Uh, and I can tell you, we've, uh, over as a veteran of the last three European elections, uh, the first two we decided not to run a, a candidate because we disagreed fundamentally with the principle. Uh, and last year we did actually try running a candidate, uh, more as a sort of protest candidate. You know, we knew we were never going to make any headway. Um, but the whole thing was a complete farce. Um, it lacks democratic legitimacy. You know, the, the, the litmus test, if you like, is, is, is voter turnout, um, which has been steadily falling uh, since 1979. You know, and, you know, the European Commission and through the Parliament is continually uh, trying to add resources and add, you know, uh, responsibility to the parties to run these things. When, in the end, um, none of it worked at all because the council said no. And we ended up with the whole process being a waste of money and a total farce. Now, let me turn now to Carlo Fidanza, um, uh, uh, a friend of, uh, uh, of uh, ECR party um, and um, a uh, member of the European Parliament since 2019 for Fratelli d'Italia party. Um, Carlo uh, was formerly in the European Parliament, so, um, so we've known him for some time. Uh, and he's a great expert on internal markets, consumer affairs, as well as local and regional politics. Uh, Carlo, uh, good afternoon to you in Italy, and I wonder if you could uh, uh, give us your opening remarks uh, and perhaps uh, with a, you know, a little bit about how things will progress over the next year or so. Don't try mute. Carlo, can you unmute? Sorry, sorry, I was I, 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 I muted myself. So thanks, thanks again, uh, Richard. Thanks to the ECR party for this occasion, this important debate, uh, this anniversary, which comes during a severe phase for Italy and for the entire Europe as well, is very special for Fratelli d'Italia, that entered the European Parliament one year ago for the first time with its own uh, symbol, with its own, its own brand, after the not so lucky experience of uh, 2014, the 6.5% from last year seems nothing compared to the percentage assigned nowadays to my party by both polls and real votes, which see us between 14 and 15% with a constant growth. And we are very confident that we are able to improve. I want to quote this fact since it was cited also within the uh, latest political simulation that remarked that our ECR group would overcome the Greens and compensate the departure of the British Tories if we could vote for the European elections today. This is mainly thanks to the results of Fratelli Italia, and we are so proud to assist the growth of our political family. On the other hand, I know that all friends from Vox, from Forum for Democracy, from the Swedish Democrats are experiencing great results, despite being in the opposition in their country, just like us. This first year has been characterized by Ursula von der Leyen's presidency, a tough start, we can say. A commission that starts once again as a downward compromise, uh, without a soul and without a strong identity. This was followed by the adoption of a, an unrealistic agenda of priorities, starting with the Green Deal, which became even more surreal after the pandemic. In addition, we had proof of this yesterday with the presentation of the Recovery Fund. It is not no mystery that there are different sensibilities uh, within our group concerning certain financial topics, as well as the choice to pursue the European solidarity by using grants or loans. Uh, me and uh, my friend Erkian are on different positions on this, and this is, this is not a mystery. But if you want the recovery fund, regardless of how it is financed, it must be intended for recovery of all those companies that most likely will not be able to recover from the COVID-19. And the extra funds will, will all be spread over budget chapters decided before the virus, as if the virus had never existed instead. Green Deal, Just Transition Fund, Digital Transactions, and so on. It seems a few months old agenda, which in this current situation is likely to be seen as 10 years old instead. I really hope that in the name of uh, realism, all the topics starting from environmental and industrial ones 
there will be the possibility for our group to leave a deep mark by breaking the axis that goes from the center towards the left. I wish the same for all the immigrations related topics that uh, Charlie was mentioning just before. During a plenary session, a narrow majority defeated the left party's agenda pro-migration. However, the left party has violated this parliament along with President Sassoli, an Italian, unfortunately, uh, by allowing a shameful catwalk to a so-called captain of a ship filled with irregular migrants, such as Carola Rackete, who is on trial in Italy, ramming a petrol boat of our Coast Guard. Furthermore, a few weeks later, in occasion of the Schumann Declaration's 70th uh, anniversary, uh, they also welcomed Luca Casarini as a spokesperson of NGO Mediterranean, likely unknown by non-Italians, but very well known to the Italian citizens, while he was leading riots against the police during the uh, 21 G8 in Genoa. There is clearly an ideological agenda that the left party is following, along with the complicity and the subordination of the EPP that undergoes everything. The role of the European Conservatives is to act as a sting towards all the political forces, not openly leftist, to rise up against the so-called politically correct and mainstream dictatorship. I'm confident that by working this way, ECR Group and ECR Party will be able to reach many targets and to continue its growth in political centrality and ability to influence our political debate. Well, thank you, Carlo. And you're absolutely right. There's never been a more important time for Conservatives to make their voice heard. And I'm delighted to see Conservative parties in Italy and Netherlands and, uh, and in Sweden, and now in Bulgaria as well, who are, who are all um, you know, doing well and hopefully will come back in the next elections with a greater responsibility. Can I just say hello to Angel Jambatsky, who I know has had a busy day on the committees, who's just joining us. So good morning to you, Angel. Oh, good afternoon. Um, let, me, let me now turn to, to Dirk Jan Epping. Uh, Dirk Jan is a Dutch journalist and politician, formerly a member of the Cabinet of the European Commissioner Fritz Bolkenstein and Sim Kallas. In March 27, uh, 2007, Epping produced his, or published his book, Life of a European Mandarin, describing his experiences in the European Commission. He was a Belgian member of the European Parliament from 2011 to 2014, and returned in 2019 as a Dutch MEP, for the Forum for Democracy Party in the Netherlands. Uh, in Brussels, he's Vice Chair of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and a great expert on all things commissions. So perhaps, Dirk, Anna, can I kick you off with, what, why, why do you think the Commission has had so many problems from the start in this mandate? Well, actually, um, the Commission, and in particular, President, uh, uh, President von der Leyen, uh, started uh, as presenting if she was in a fairy tale. And the way she's speaking sounds like a fairy tale, um, but actually it is not. Um, and let me tell you that one year ago, when I ran in the elections, I presented this book, which is called European Realism, in which I predicted that we would be close to a new euro crisis because of the, of the economic developments. And even earlier than I expected, it's already there. So one in one year, lots Lots of things have happened. First of all, uh, a, a Brexit, which is still being negotiated. Uh, the victory of the Conservative Party in the UK, which gave the UK uh, more courage and self-confidence. Uh, we've had the COVID-19, in which we're still involved. Um, that, that has caused the Euro problems in the Eurozone area. But what we have seen yesterday, and then basically... Uh, is my point if you talk about the Commission. Uh, the Commission regards Corona uh, as a sort of a blessing in the guise in the sense it can bolster its own power and its own money. And the problem with the uh, recovery plan is that everything goes through the Commission. Um, so uh, the, the, the means are taken away from member states and then they go through the Commission and they make the Commission more powerful and they turn it into sort of a uh, government of the European Union. Uh, that's, the, that's also the intention of the European Commission and the intention of the Federalists. And behind that you see appearing the debate on the future of Europe in which you've got Mr. Verhofstadt as a cheerleader who um, wants to establish a European empire. 
So we are in on a way of people coming up with designs that are totally unrealistic. And that's why I said yesterday in the plenary that the EU is Icarus on its way to the sun. Um, and I'm afraid that's the way uh, things are, uh, are going. So the EU is using the current situation, or rather abusing, to strengthen its own position, uh, to uh, jockey for position to become the government, the government of, of Europe. And we have a completely different view of Europe. There's a Europe of nation states, of a community of uh, sovereign states that work well together. And in that way, you know, uh, every country should be uh, prepared to help countries in difficulties with emergency funds and other funds and bilateral ways or with some countries together that can be done. That's why a reason why, uh, why we have another row with the Italian uh, uh, party uh, because I do not blame uh, the Italian party or Italians or anything. And what I blame, do blame, is the structure of the EU that puts one country against the other uh, and that tries to, to strengthen its own centralistic position, pushing sovereign nations aside, blame, blaming them, um, using Article 7, so, the, the so-called rule of law, uh, and, and that's the wrong structure. So we have to uh, remain friends, we are friends, we have to remain friends, because uh, uh, Fratelli is not the problem. The problem is the structure uh, in which we are now going to be absorbed. And there we have to show an alternative in the form of a community of sovereign states or European states or whatever you will call it. Uh, because if you do nothing, then we'll be history. Uh, Mr. Verhofstadt will uh, plant his European empire some way with even bigger budgets. So that's basically in one year a lot has happened, and we are as, uh, we are facing serious problems. Thank you, Dirk. And if I can just stick with you for a minute, I mean, as a, a monetary affairs um, uh, specialist and uh, and expert, how, how was your reaction to the, uh, the announcement yesterday of the seven hundred and fifty billion? Bearing in mind the Netherlands has been one of the key voices against it. Yes, well, I was not uh, surprised because we had the proposal of uh, Merkel Macron, uh, 500 billion. Of course, obviously, the Commission always has to put something on top uh, with 500 in the forms of grants and 250 in the forms of loans. You see, in, in the Netherlands, this is going to be a very hot topic of our elections next year in March. Um, the Commission intends to increase own resources by introducing new uh, European taxation. But I pointed out uh, yesterday uh, in the plenary that there is a long procedure of ratification. Ratification by 27 member states, a hurdle of over 50 parliaments, only Belgium already has six parliaments. And uh, that will be uh, a long way. So we'll have uh, hot debates about that. It's very contentious, but um, uh, we have to find a way to get together as conservatives uh, uh, and come with a different view on Europe as we see it, and not this procedure, this process towards the, the federal uh, state, EU state, as Brussels sees now the chance to build it. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Um, let me now turn to Angel Jambatsky. Can you, can you hear us? Angel? Yes, Richard. Good morning. Uh, hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. So, um, so Angel Jambas, okay. thank you for joining us. Um, Angel is a member of the European Parliament uh, since 2014 and vice chair of the IMRO party in Bulgaria. Formerly he was a member of the Sofia uh, City Council. Um, and I guess you joined, you joined us from Brussels or from Sofia? No, no from Brussels. From, from Brussels. Brussels. I, I was in, in trunk committee for, for a while. Excellent. Right, well, let's, let's, let's kick off. Um, just a general question. I mean, um, you know, have we seen much progress being made over the last year since the European elections? Well, um, it seems to me that uh, this, this crisis, pandemic crisis, will be used by our political opponents in their idea to create, uh, as uh, Mr. Epping said, uh, to create some kind of uh, you know, Europe, Federation Europe or be a European uh, federal state, something like this. So we need to organize ourselves as conservatives, as people with uh, common ideas, how to, uh, to create our own uh, uh, formula, how to, to organize our efforts, CCR efforts, uh, in idea to, to explain 
uh, much more visible our point of view um, for a future Europe of uh, sovereign nations, uh, Europe of fatherland, something like this. I'm not sure we succeeded in this uh, in past year, but well, uh, we can explain this. Uh, first of all, it was uh, um, a number of new colleagues and then um, uh, this uh, hysteria created by pandemia. But now uh, Mr. Verhofstadt is using um, uh, this uh, opportunity to, to push very hard in federal, in federal way uh, to create this uh, federal, uh, federal idea. So uh, I, I, I believe we need to organize ourselves uh, much, much more and to, to, to be much more visible. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Angel. Um, if I may now turn back to Carlo, um, attitudes in Italy have, been cha have changed a lot since last year. Um, why do you think, particularly in Italy, more people are turning to conservatism? Uh, can you repeat the last part of the question, Richard, please? Yeah, because yeah. I had problems with the, with, the, uh, with the audio. Yeah, so, I mean, attitudes have changed uh, you know, quite a lot over the last year, bear in mind all the, the things that have taken place. Um, you know, uh, what, why do you think more people in Italy are turning to conservatism? Uh, yes, uh, but I think that uh, we, uh, we had uh, always in the past a wide majority of Italian people on culturally on the center right uh, side, but not always uh, the political parties on the center right uh, uh, um, framework uh, could give the people uh, uh, the, 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 the right uh, uh, the, the right political offer. I, I can say, and in this uh, in this period, we are doing uh, this, and uh, we as Fratelli are, are growing more and more, also with a, a strong Lega, but Lega is going a bit down uh, after the uh, the rupture uh, with the previous government, because as you perfectly know, uh, some uh, months ago we have a change. Of the government, of the government, when uh, when Five Stars Movement uh, uh, turned uh, uh, from the right to the to the left, we can say, and uh, abandoning Salvini and doing a new government with the uh, with the, the leftists. And uh, in this period, uh, despite of uh, uh, the absence from the government, from a part of the center right, so uh, specifically from uh, Lega. Uh, our coalition is growing uh, more and more and Fratelli in the coalition is growing more and more and we oh. now uh, are the government of uh, the majority the okay. of the regions and uh, ma many uh, to, important uh, uh, to, cities to, to, and so uh, we are very confident computer? on the next regional elections so you, waiting you can just for change. some changes okay. uh, in the national framework but naturally we are uh, absolutely uh, can I ask um, you, I'm not sure if it's uh, uh, to sure that it's not so um, it's uh, easy to, to come to, to hit this dock, uh, dock station here maybe we have some uh, it's not up to you okay angle okay. angle angle Please, yes, we yes, have yes. noises from you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, because naturally we have a, a very um, wide part of the, uh, the, the current parliament that are uh, going not to be confirmed in uh, uh, next uh, uh, national election. So we, we know that power is a very strong uh, uh, clue and uh, glue and, and and so uh we are not so confident of the, in, in the fact that we can go to new national elections uh very very early but we are uh, fighting about uh, and we are fighting on this and uh, we we hope to to have soon the ch chance to be part of the of a new government after new elections and uh, naturally the, the last thing i want to say is that uh, um, there's the um, sort of concern in Italy uh, about the fact that in the autumn we can have a new um, uh, financial shock on the markets and uh, uh, favoring uh, a, a new technical government as we had, had in the past with the, with the Mario Monti experience, which was terrible for, for the Italian citizens. So we are also to, um, we have also to face this kind of uh, uh, possibility because it is uh, on the ground or under the ground at the moment, but everyone in the corridors is speaking about this. 
And, and Carlo, when can we expect the next Italian elections, national elections? Uh, but uh, we have a lot of announces from the government, uh, but a very, uh, <clears throat> very hard delay in uh, giving money to uh, families and to businesses. And uh, the, uh, the angry uh, from people is growing. And it's not so simple also for us as a, an opposition party to uh, maintain uh, a balance between our need and our duty to represent this angry from the people and on the other side, not to push on the angry because it could, be, it could become social uh, riots and, and so on. So we, we are uh, um, trying to maintain this kind of balance, represent, representing these uh, uh, difficulties from people and businesses, but uh, maintaining these on this institutional uh, language and in the institutional framework. It's not so simple. We have uh, some demonstrations, some uh, events, some, ra some rallies in the next uh, uh, weeks uh, against the government, but always maintaining this kind of balance because we know that the delegitimation of the politics in general could be a risk also for our party and for politics in general. So uh, we have to, to, to do this kind of work that it's not, not so simple for, for, for us as an opposition party, but we, we, are, we are trying to, to keep together uh, the opposition field with the responsibility uh, mood. Mm -hmm. Turn to Charlie. Um, prior to the, 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 the pandemic, you know, conservatives were on the march and, uh, you know, we were seeing people turn to the movement and, uh, you know, and things, were, things were, were, were looking rather good. Of course, during the pandemic, we've seen a swing to incumbent governments. But, you know, this is only very temporary as we, as we ease out of these measures and all these restrictions at the moment. Uh, I imagine things will, will get back to some sense of normality. But, you know, in Sweden, you've seen a, a turn towards conservatism. What do you think is fueling that? Well, I do think there are many factors at play here. Um, number one is the uh, utter mismanagement of the country by... Uh, continuous governments of both the left and the right for, for many years. Um, one has to remember that um, despite uh, tax cuts by the center-right government, uh, it uh, also pursued an agenda for very liberal migration, uh, striking deals with the Greens uh, in order to, to open up the borders and to grant asylum without asking questions to, to almost anyone that applied from Afghanistan to the Middle East. And uh, the reaction has come. And uh, more and more people realize that uh, this is a problem that um, these politicians have uh, brought upon us, that uh, there was uh, one party that warned for this uh, all these years, uh, that scorned party, uh, uh, conservative Sweden Democrats. Um, and uh, I do think uh, that um, one can compare with, uh, you know, consumer behavior. One looks for the authentic uh, alternatives, whether it's, you know, bread or, you know, for the barbecue or for the homemaking or whatever. You look for what is uh, true and authentic. And that goes for politics as well. So when when the center-right EPP parties and others are trying to, to strengthen their language, I think that a lot of voters just don't trust them because they remember the very same politicians telling us that this mass migration to Sweden will serve as well, will strengthen the budget, will save the pensions, as if uh, migrants don't get older as well as the rest of us. Uh, they remember that, and they are punishing these parties and politicians for that by turning to uh, parties such as mine. And of course, you also see uh, parties such as the Sweden Democrats uh, maturing over the years. So, for instance, uh, my party um, uh, embraced conservatism about 10 years ago, uh, and that, that has uh, uh, developed uh, the internal discussions. It uh, 
makes us read books that we wouldn't have read otherwise. And, uh, and now we're even launching a think tank, the first conservative think tank in Sweden for a hundred years. Uh, so, so you see this movement uh, and it's both a discontent and, uh, and thanks to, to a development. Um, and, and I do think that uh, we are going to be part of, uh, in one form or another, the governing coalition with the EPP parties after 2022, the next elections in Sweden. Thank you, Charlie. Now, to, to Dirk Jan, can we expect to see a similar thing in the, in the Netherlands? I mean, your party has, uh, has had enormous success in the last few years um, and uh, must be a contender for government in the near future. Um, but uh, how, how are things there in the Netherlands with, uh, with the party? So I first have to unmute myself, yeah. which I've done, I hope. Uh, well, we're having elections uh, mid-March uh, next year. Uh, we have been uh, very successful as a party, only having been there for three years. We've got now uh, 45,000 members. In terms of members, the biggest party of the Netherlands altogether. Uh, we became biggest party at the provincial elections uh, in 2019. We got four seats in the European Parliament uh, out of zero. Um, so we've been doing very well. Uh, the COVID crisis had, has turned a swing in favor of the incumbent uh, uh, party, the VVD, the Liberal Party of Prime Minister Rutte. It's one of the reasons why Prime Minister Rutte has to defend fiscal sovereignty, so to say, of the Netherlands very harshly because otherwise he's afraid that uh, his uh, party is going to be reduced and cut in size. So that's one of the explanations. Um, in, in, in opinion polls have gone up and down, so it's hard to predict what is coming out of it. Uh, we'll see, but uh, certainly FVD is a, a contender for government coalitions if, uh, if possible. Uh, obviously, we need to do well at the elections. I think in the, in the issues, the election issues, they're basically all European issues, like, for example, uh, the euro, um, the, um, um, the test of Dutch people for EU taxation is very strong. Uh, if we look at migration, and here we're on the same line as our friends in uh, Italy and in, and in and Spain, uh, we've had a lot of migration over the years. And, um, uh, and we have, on the other hand, because of the Green Deal, all sorts of building restrictions, uh, because you can hardly build a bridge or a house or anything. Um, and as a result, we are, we are short of housing. Uh, more people are coming. We cannot increase building. Uh, prices of housing is going up. Uh, they become very expensive, and the purchase power of people, of average citizens, are being reduced that way. So that's one of the reasons why citizens in the Netherlands are not very eager to start paying uh, uh, in, the, within the, in the framework of the European Union. Uh, the climate policy uh, has been, the government has been trying to push through the climate agenda of Mr. Timmer, Timmermans very harshly, uh, but it's now meeting a lot of resistance, which the FED has always been organizing and spokesman of. So generally spoken, I think we are in a, in, in a good position to press for these uh, issues uh, and to make clear that there is an alternative for the left policies that are steered, are basically uh, promoted by the Greens, uh, by socialists. They are not in government, but they're determining the agenda of the government, of which they are not a part, uh, and that people will turn to uh, parties that are more realistic and will give uh, the population another choice uh, next to what is happening now. Now, we have to present that choice, uh, and we also have to present a different view uh, on, uh, on Europe. I was already mentioning community of uh, European sovereign states. That would be a very good start. A loser association in which we respect each other. Because in the current, the st uh, current uh, construct structure, the one country is railing against another country. And this is very bad uh, since we are, it, it tries to press us into a straight jacket nobody really wants to be in, but we're forced there. And a loser 
um, a structure would be much more comfortable and it was much more willing to help each other, respect each other, respect the constitutions of other countries uh, and then also the, the aspirations of, of, of other countries. And I, th I think that's, that's a Europe uh, my children would like to live in, but not in this authoritarian, centralistic uh, European Union that is now like Icarus going for the sun. Thank, thank you, Dirk. Yeah. Um, if I, uh, obviously, in Bulgaria, Angel, the situation is slightly different. We've got we've got three three strong voices from from Western Europe, but in Central Europe, how are people reacting to uh, you know what's going on in Europe at the moment, um, and where are the opportunities for your party uh, in in the near future? Well, um, people now now are watching what is happening in Europe. Uh, because, uh, as you know, maybe, maybe not, um, this pandemia was not so strong in Bulgaria. So the number of casualties is uh, quite low, uh, happily. Uh, but uh, there is uh, enormous uh, uh, damage to our economy, because our economy is based uh, mainly on tourism, on transportation. Um, so these, uh, uh, these jobs now are... Um, let's say in danger so people are, are watching all the debates on on um, uh, this uh, uh, trans, uh, um, mff uh, transition fund etc etc uh, but perspectives um, in front of uh, our political party we are coalition exactly uh, are quite good i think because we are very vocal we are the people in bulgaria who are defending our society from the refugees we are very vocal uh, with a very strong and clear position against the, uh, the negotiations between the European Union and Turkey for membership. Uh, we are very vocal on Western Balkans. As you know, uh, we almost uh, each and every Bulgarian recognize Macedonia as a second Bulgarian country, second Bulgarian state on the Balkans. So now we are defending all these positions, migration, Turkey, um, Euro realism against the Euro federalism, uh, but uh, frankly speaking, we are part of the government now, and you know, um, always when there is some kind of uh, economical troubles, uh, people are not very happy with with the government, uh, and uh, we, as uh, um, let's say a junior junior member of the the government, uh, are in such a position. But still, uh, we will have um, general elections ne next year in uh, in March, I believe. Uh, on this, in this part of the political uh, the, the political sphere in Bulgaria, we are maybe the strongest political coalition. We and our partners from National uh, Front for, uh, for the Bulgarian Front National Salvation. So I believe we will defend our positions. Uh, on the the past uh, the local elections, uh, we we doubled the number of. Uh, Members of all the uh, local uh, local uh, local city councils, uh, we won a number of uh, mayors of the important for our cities. So we 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 went pretty good in the uh, in these elections. But we'll see what will happen in uh, in next year. Thank thank you, Angel. Now, if if I could turn now to as we're sort of almost three quarters of the way through to the future. So perhaps, Charlie, what steps can the European Commission now take to reform uh, uh, and for the, for the next year? Charlie, can you unmute? So I think the, the question we as conservatives need to ask ourselves is uh, what steps should the commission take because we do know what steps they will take they will use the corona crisis as a pretext for power grabs for uh, indebting our children and grandchildren you know the grants and loans that they uh, suggested uh, yesterday i mean they are supposed to be repaid until 2058 it's a disgrace so Instead of you know only focusing on what they will do, I I I want to say a few words about what a conservative commission 
sh should and probably would do. Um, and um, we are now facing um, the um, process of the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe. And for those who remember what happened 20 years ago when they established a convention to have a constitution for Europe, they rigged that convention. They let Valéry Giscard d'Estaing run the show on his own, sidelining those in favor of decentralized power. Uh, he was the one deeming what would be appropriate to include in the draft constitution, which was eventually rewritten after the popular rejections in the Netherlands and France uh, as the Lisbon Treaty. Now, the EPP, Socialists, Liberals, Greens, and Communists have joined ranks in the European Parliament, sidelining us Eurorealists and Euroskeptics in the process. They don't want us to disrupt their ambitions for a United States of Europe. Well, we should disrupt, mainly by doing two things. First, we should present reforms based upon intergovernmentalism, a cooperation between free nation states. And this agenda should include, I think, how the competences of the European Union should be reformed and what competences could be returned to the member states. How flexibility rather than the one size fits all approach could be implemented. Uh, we should have a, an independent review of the acquis communautaire uh, cost-benefit analysis of the different EU programs and agencies, um, red card procedure, make um, the Commission and the EU as a whole democratically accountable. And um, secondly, we should turn to the peoples of Europe, as they repeatedly, in referendum after referendum, have shown little appetite for the super, supranational utopia of the Brussels elite. We should mobilize the whole of the ECR family, including the member parties throughout Europe, to counter this attempted power grab that goes under the name Conference of the Future of Europe and Corona Crisis Package. Thank you, Charlie. I, I mean, on the one hand, Conservatives are on the march across Europe, but at the same time, we have this leftist Greener Parliament and we have this agenda that the Commission is putting through, which is all rather depressing. Now, Dirk, Jan, I know you've been very active as well on this uh, Future of Europe conference as well. Perhaps you could give us some, some of your thoughts on it. Yes, well, I fully uh, agree with, uh, with Charlie uh, that we have to look to the future uh, and uh, for an other horizon. And we have to show people that there is an alternative to the current trend towards an authoritarian centralist uh, EU. Um, if I look at the process now, I'm afraid that that's the reason I use the expression Icarus on the way to the sun, um, that this, go, this, this, this entire uh, megalomanic uh, project uh, is going to stagnate somewhere down the road. So we have started it now. Uh, it will take a long time. Um, you've got loans and, uh, and grants, etc. Uh, do you get the money from the capital markets? Uh, how will that work? Will there be enough? Another question is, uh, new European taxes, does the EU get enough money uh, out of taxation for its projects? Because, for example, they say, oh, we're going to tax a, a big tech, you know, or Facebook and Twitter and all these other, other folks. Uh, they're all stationed in, in Ireland. And uh, how is the Irish Parliament going to vote then on, this, uh, on, on these proposals when these big tech companies start to press? They say, well, we're going to take on the oil companies. Well, if there are, is there's one sector in the forefront of the Green Deal, right, it's a, uh, it are the oil companies because they are greening themselves to be ahead of the, of the curve and they are subsidizing all sorts of green movements. Uh, the big capital uh, is part of, of this of this entire setup. Um, so I, I think we uh, should come up with uh, counter proposals as Charlie uh, already referred to, we're very busy with it to do so. Uh, and, um, and, and shortly we should come with, with, uh, with our proposals uh, as, uh, instead of just waiting to see what the left, the center left uh, here in this parliament is going to do. Well, they want to monopolize basically everything. 
uh, the uh, uh, opinion, the leading opinions. They create a pensée unique where you all have to say and think uh, the same uh, thing. They uh, uh, they repress all sorts of dissent that you have. You know when you speak, you laugh. That's the uh, you're not taken seriously. You're regarded like a, a person of the past and uh, uncle who lived in uh, Bulgaria <laughs> may remember the days the days that uh, it was a, a centralist state and, and 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 Polish and Bulgarians and Czech they feel what's going on they feel this authoritarianism uh, uh, seeping through in the structures of the of the EU uh, if I look, uh, actually were looking at who is financing who in the in the EU, and you see that the EU, the Commission, the European Commission, is trying to buy media, think tanks, universities, universities, NGO, the whole bunch, and the money, money, the amount which is at their disposal is so huge, they could basically buy the entire press. So they want to buy public opinion. And prevent it from knowing what's going on. So we have to act fast, be in time to be successful. But we must be the other voice, and we must have to current the courage to push it forward. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I mean, Carlo, uh, recent polls in Italy suggest that um, dissatisfaction with the European Union is growing fast, uh, and you know it's clearly very true that. The EU has used giant sticking plasters to address the big issues of the day, namely euro and migration. Um, and, you know, the, the, inherently the problem is not solved. Um, what's the current feeling in Italy at the moment and what would you like to see uh, put forward as the priorities? Uh, yes, I fully agree with uh, uh, Charlie and Dertian, and uh, um, you have to say that uh, in Italy uh, the, the main feeling against EU is uh, related to uh, um, lack of solidarity. So we have to to keep attention on this because uh, uh, the lack of solidarity could be uh, uh, could be read uh, by uh, the Euro Federalists as a need of more and more Europe. So we have to uh, decline our different idea, and I agree with our uh, friends also. In the, in the need of uh, um, of uh, um, trying to 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 write the fields in uh, in which we in, we want uh, uh, competencies uh, uh, on EU and and the, the other fields in which we want uh, national competencies, we need to do so in our view also in 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 the view of the, of the the compass for the future of Europe. And I want to profit of the of, of the, the floor also to um, agree with that Jan, about a, a few words that he said uh, just before about the tensions among uh, uh, member states caused by the, this kind of agenda euro federalistic agenda and about the eurozone that i think that uh, it, it is one of the most uh, hard the, the hardest uh, reasons of, of tensions uh, because uh, if you uh, want a well-balanced uh, uh, macroeconomic um, area you need transfers from the richest countries to the less rich and uh, this is a, a macroeconomical uh, theory it, it's it's normal that it has to be so uh, but um, uh, without a national sovereign bank the transfers are uh, the, the the buying uh, uh, activity from the ECB, and so we, as Italy, for example, are in a paradox because we are a rich country but with a very high debt, and uh, we are a net contributor to the EU uh, budget. But we need the buying uh, the buying activity by uh, the uh, from the ECB. So uh, we are in this kind of paradox because we need more solidarity that now is guaranteed uh, only from the ECB because we have no and uh, our we have not our national sovereign bank and we uh, have no our national sovereign currency. So this is one of the the most uh, difficult problems that we have to to to, to face uh, and it's difficult also in our national domestic debate 
because we know that the, the disease. Uh, but now, in this moment, we need more solidarity and more transfers. That is uh, what our Dutch friends uh, or Austrian friends don't want. So, and this is our difficult situation that we have to, to manage. Nat naturally, we can do so uh, imagining a new and different uh, Europe to, to, to be rebuilt in our uh, view, but it's not, it's not so simple to uh, imagine this now with the current measures we have to take. So this is the difficult we have to face, and I, I think that uh, uh, we have to work closely together uh, and uh, bringing our uh, group and our political family together, uh, giving this uh, strong message that a new, different Europe can uh, come uh, soon, very, very early. Thank you. And uh, I mean, already we can see, but there, there, are, there are some challenges for us here because uh, the European Federalist dream will just be more Europe, more Europe, more Europe. Um, so we have to come up with proper proposals, costed uh, uh, and effective uh, suggest uh, solutions and suggestions that can help for the future. Perhaps, Angel, you could give us your view from Bulgaria on uh, how you see the future of uh, Europe. Uh, thank you once again, Richard. Um, indeed, this conference of uh, Future of Europe will be very important for us. So that's why we are organizing this uh, working group and uh, trying to uh, to make our own formula. Uh, but, uh, but if it's up to us, we need uh, to have uh, much more uh, deregulation in the uh, European Union, uh, not more, uh, but less. We need to have uh, strong protection of our external borders. Uh, we have to be very strong against the migration uh, out from outside uh, the Europe. And we need to uh, not to allow to uh, uh, Brussels bureaucracy to uh, to be in charge. Uh, Mr. Epping uh, mentioned uh, previous times regarding uh, bureaucracy. It was the same. All decisions were made and uh, were taken in Kremlin, and then via so-called red phone, uh, they they were distributed all the uh, the, the capitals formally uh, independent, but not so. Uh, uh, we are we are facing something very similar. Um, decisions uh, are taken here in uh, on Berlemont, uh, very close to, to, to us, and then uh, uh, all the the citizens and uh, uh, governments are just just informed what happened. So uh, we need less uh, uh, regulation. We need very strong uh, uh, policy against the migration. We need very strong protection of our external borders, and uh, we need to keep uh, our internal sing single market. Uh, because, uh, let's say, so-called mobili mobility package is something very strong against this. And, uh, uh, for example, President Macron is uh, accusing, um, uh, um, let's say, drivers from uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, uh, to, to work against the, the rules of the single market. But he is doing the same in France now. So there is a very, very, very visible double standard. And this is very hypocritical. So uh, I, I believe we as a conservatives, uh, we need to, uh, to prepare ourselves for this um, uh, convent or convention or conference for the future of Europe. Maybe we, we already discussed this with uh, uh, Carlo and uh, all the, 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 the members to organize our our discussion, something something different from uh, uh, this federalist uh, attempt, uh, att uh, attempt for Q in in European Union, and so we we need uh, to work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. So we just have a few minutes uh, left. So if we just we'll just have a, a round of uh, final comments. But I, I guess, Charlie, if I start with you, um, if we had the European elections tomorrow, how different do you think the results would be? And how best should we be putting pressure on the Commission and on the Federalist uh, uh, leftist Green Parliament uh, to make our voice heard? Charlie, can you unmute? Can you unmute? <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, I would uh, stress uh, the need for uh, reform. I would uh, I would point at 
uh, the need to draw the right conclusions out of uh, the corona crisis. After all, what this crisis has shown is that uh, European political leaders, uh, as well as the populations of the European nations, are are really um, viewing the nation state as the primary agent in times of crisis. This is in accordance with human nature. We turn to our demos when things are getting rough. Um, and, um, and then uh, to, to have a, an intergovernmental European policy that will help us, for instance, be better prepared for the next crisis by, by uh, joint procurement and other things, but uh, really go after those ideas for a power grab that uh, the commission, as well as some heads of government, are are trying to to push for right now, uh, because this is not what uh, the peoples of Europe want. And I do think that uh, one thing that we need to to uh, ask for is uh, referendums on any treaty change that uh, the federalists uh, propose, because uh, we will win that. Uh, thank you very much, Charlie. So, uh, Carlo, a few closing remarks. Can we expect to see a referendum in Italy? Uh, we are not allowed from the, our constitution, uh, but it's one of our uh, domestic proposals uh, to change the constitution to, uh, in order to allow uh, these referendums on, on the treaty changes in the, on the international fields. And uh, we hope that with a new majority in the future, we can do this. We can do, we can do this. Uh, and I think that for, for the future, uh, if, if we could have the new European elections tomorrow, I think that one of the most important things to try to change something is that the, 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 the center-right parties, starting from EPP, uh, give up from their subordination from the leftist agenda. It's terrible what we are seeing uh, nowadays. Uh, also on uh, topics that are uh, very uh, normal, we can we can mention, for example, when we voted uh, a resolution about the persecution of the Christians all around the world, uh, they accepted finally a, a text without the word Christians. So we we couldn't <laughs> say officially who were, who was prosecuted by by whom. It's terrible if you if you if you think about a, a Christian inspired uh, group or party to be so uh, subaltern, subaltern. It's correct. Yes, subordinated to the the, the mm -hmm. cultural leftist agenda. So this is one of our problems because we can do. An, uh, we, we, we have to, to, to build alliances on, on, on some issues and naturally we know that we can cooperate with some uh, delegations in the ID group but we need also cooperation with uh, some delegation in, in, in the EPP group and it's very difficult that at the moment because they are totally subordinated. So uh, I know that in the, in the simulation that I mentioned in my, in my first intervention, the EPP is growing like us we are the we we would be the only two groups growing and all, all the others were going down uh, but if epp is is that of is that of now it's not so useful that they are growing <laughs> we can we can have a, a, a growing problem instead uh, uh, that than a, a possible ally on some issues so i think that is uh, one of the of, of the, the the things on we, on which we have to push um, always uh, trying to 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 to, um, to tell them that if they are a center right party, so called, uh, they have to stick on the on these uh, values and principles. Because uh, on the other uh, side, we have to uh, to stress that they are betraying uh, these principles. Thank you, thank you, Carlos. Uh, and Dokan, is this the answer? I mean, is it more collaboration across the uh, political spectrum to fight this leftist green agenda? Um, or should we stick to our guns and uh, uh, stick, plug on with our ideology? Um, where's the compromise and what do you think will be the most effective? Uh, well, I think, first of all, we have to uh, work closely together 
because it is a debate you'll see in all uh, societies of, uh, of Europe where the left is controlling public opinion by the media, by universities, think tanks, and as a result, they're also subsidized by the European Union. So the voice of the European Commission is prevalent uh, everywhere, uh, and you're not allowed to go against it. And I think, uh, Carlo, has a point on, on solidarity, what we have to show is how real solidarity works. Solidarity between uh, countries can be very strong. If something happens in one country, other countries can help. Uh, what, we not, what we see now is that we are in this um, a sort of a, a Eurozone prison in which we are kept and pushed against each other. Uh, and then Brussels says, oh, no, we know what to do now. We're going to get some money from the capital market and we're going to bring it here and there. And these are the bad ones there in the north. And uh, we should be more, we should be uh, more, uh, show solidarity by uh, more money, etc. Uh, it, uh, the, the aim of that is not Corona. The aim of that is to strengthen the power of the EU and in Brussels and centralist powers. And that is basically what we have to make clear. Uh, and an, an, an example of, you know, where we should work together is, is guarding the borders. You know, Fratelli and us, we're on the same page here. Um, and then we have Frontex, but Frontex is basically peddling over people from one country to another. Uh, peddle, uh, the, the, once we had a buzz of, of, of Frontex uh, coming to see us in the group, and I was amazed that it was a sort of a ferry. Uh, ferry bringing people from Africa to Europe. I said, well, that's not your task. I said, no, we do what the, what the governments tell us to do. We just help them. Well, if you have a leftist government wanting to have more immigration, you get all the people there. You know, we should then have a, a cooperation between the Italian and Dutch Navy and make sure that we control borders and work together between member states. And we work very well. We so we have a, we are living in a Europe where you can uh, travel around and uh, and when when Corona is gone we can uh, have very close ties and act immediately uh, between member states and it's much more efficient than go to Brussels because Brussels has only one thing in mind is how to strengthen ourselves so where do we get our steroids from today uh, so uh, it takes it takes it away from the nation states and it, it, the aim of, of the EU is now also to weaken the nation states so. Um, that we be the voice of the nation states of our diversity and our history and our culture and our values uh, so that people have a reference, they have something to look at and they can say, yes, that's something we vote for because that is us. Thank you, Dirk. Jan. If I can give the final word to Angel Jambaski, um, we're just about out of time. But, um, you know, I remember the enlargements in 2004, 2007. You know, the prospect of joining the EU was like this magic pill, okay? Has it turned out to be a poison pill? <laughs> what do we need to do to, 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 to help you in your part of the world? Uh, well, uh, I remember yesterday, or our working group meeting, uh, Professor Krasnodesky mentioned one word, it, it, the, the world was a perestroika. And I remember something. Uh, the Chernobyl disaster was in 1986. Then uh, how the, uh, uh, the, the, the communist uh, leadership in Soviet Union, outside Soviet Union, they lied what, what happened. Then uh, they, they tried to cover this with so-called perestroika in 1989. And then Soviet Union collapsed. So with uh, uh, all the, the Eastern uh, bloc, let's say. Now we have uh, our uh, uh, Chinese Chernobyl. And we are facing uh, Federalist Perestroika uh, 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 chaired by uh, Mr. Verhofstadt. If we let them to do so, we know will, what will happen with the European Union. The, uh, it, it seems to me the uh, Euro, uh, Union will follow the collapse of the Soviet one. So uh, it's not the, the, there, is, there is no one solution. There are no magic pills. Uh, we need to, to be very, very clear and to stand for our values, national state, national sovereignty, uh, national values, and uh, Europe of, uh, of uh, free and sovereign nations. That's it, that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Uh, historically, all empires have fallen, uh, usually because they're
willing to adapt. Okay, uh, and therein is a, is a lesson for the future of the European Union. Now, I'd just like to, we've run out of time, so I'd just like to extend a huge vote of thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, it's been a very lively and interesting discussion. Uh, we can talk for hours more, but uh, uh, we've come to the end. So thank you to you. Uh, thank you also to the many people that have been watching online. Uh, and I would just like to close by saying, please do join us for future ECR webinars, uh, which, uh, which details can be found on our social media, on our websites. Uh, uh, and I think this is the sixth that we've done now, so I'm sure a lot of you are getting used to it. Uh, but thank you to all of you. Uh, I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon. Stay safe, uh, and I hope to see you again here soon. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.